welcome to a, I think, special Dividend Cafe. Um, we're at the midway point of 2021. And so I am here to bring you listeners of the podcast and viewers of the video a little recap of where we are halfway through 2021 and what we're kind of looking to into the second half of the year um, as we delve into the third quarter. Uh, it is kind of surreal to think about where, where we are because you're looking and, and analyzing and thinking about markets while at the same time doing that through the whole context of what's been going on with COVID, what's been going on with our national politics, the election we had uh, seven, eight months ago. You know, you have a lot of things that all kind of overlap with one another. And uh, for one thing, does it, it, it distorts our view of time. And I talk about that a little bit in Dividend Cafe today that you you get this sort of mixed feeling of, oh, it, it seems like it's been forever or it seems like it's just been yesterday. And I think that's a lot of the reason why people have these kind of cliche responses about time going by is because there, it's a mixed bag. I mean, there's a, there's a sense in which it uh, does seem like things are going on longer than they have been in another sense, which has gone so quickly. But just isolating to the calendar year 2021, the way I think about these things is that the calendar year is useful as a kind of um, differentiator in markets uh, from one year to the next. You know, technically, what should have changed in markets from the second week of January versus the third week of a December? Obviously, nothing. It's totally irrelevant, except for you need kind of points of segmentation. And, mar and uh, calendars help provide some of that uh, divisibility in the way we look at markets. So I think that's useful. But for me, um, I have sort of a structure to the way I live my life and the way that my calendar years go. And I have for a long, long time taken the week after Christmas going into New Year's to write a white paper that will summarize everything from the year before and kind of offer forward looking perspectives in the year ahead. And so for me to think about that paper I wrote right now is six months ago, it is interesting because for one thing, a lot of the things I was talking about as of 2021 forecast were at, at the end of June 21 now going into July, and the stories already kind of played themselves out. Some are still playing out. I'll talk about that in a moment. But my point is that um, if, if someone had told me when I was writing that white paper that six months would go by and I would feel the way I feel and the things would have happened the way they've happened, and that the media would cover stuff the way they've covered it, and then the narratives that would take hold in markets would have been what they've been. Some of them would have surprised me, some would not. Um, but I do believe that there is far more rationality and expectation to what has taken place in markets than others may feel. There's other things that I think are still a little cuckoo, and we're going we're gonna to talk about some of that. But let's just kind of get down to the, the brass tacks of it all. The fact of the matter is that just on a basic market summary level, the um, uh, S&P is up roughly 15% halfway through the year. The Dow is, is a little less than that at about 14%. The NASDAQ is up uh, about 12 and a half. Um, and yet, like half of that was in the last few weeks. So the NASDAQ had been the big laggard and it actually at one point retested its low for the uh, going into a slightly negative territory for the calendar year, come back quite strong. Uh, small cap index, even though all of this really took place in the first quarter of the year, uh, the Russell 2000 is up over 17% on the year. So those are the four major and most broad market indices, the Dow, S&P, NASDAQ, and Russell 2000 all of which basically being up somewhere between 12 and 17% in six months. Um, I put a chart at Dividend Cafe to show you the S&P going back for 12 months. So from the end of June of last year where, uh, uh, through, through now, it just looks like the straight diagonal line up. Now, the fact of the matter is there were a couple of kind of bumpy moments on the way. And then the way the whole chart has played out is the S&P has gone from 3,100 to 4,300 it doesn't feel like any of that choppiness mattered or, or, or even ever happened, but at the moment it was happening, it did. And this is a very common thing in markets, by the way. But I, I do want to cover a couple other pieces uh, along the way, just 
to give you the backdrop of what's happening in markets. And then I want to talk about why these things have gone the way they've gone and what we're looking to in the latter portion of the year. Uh, within these broad market indices that have done pretty well, it's been far more Darwinian, far more dispersed than it would indicate. You have you sometimes have periods where markets up 10% and pretty much everything in the market is up between 7 and 13% or something like that. That would be a hyper narrow dispersion of results. Well, the top performing sector in markets this year is energy, and it's up 45%. And energy was by far the worst performing sector last year. Now, this dispersion is pretty dramatic, but um, utilities are the worst performing sector. And, and even with the dramatic dispersion, they're still positive. So 11 out of 11 sectors in the equity market have a positive return in the calendar year, but utilities are up about 2.5% year to date. Um, nothing is really all that close to energy at 45, but in second place is financials, which are up 26%. So those were two of the, the laggards last year, and then the two leaders this year. Uh, pretty interesting. Now, the bond market I'm going to talk about more, uh, especially as we look into the second half of the year around the yield curve and around credit conditions and what it says about pricing risk right now in the, just the overall financial universe. But I think that um, the 10-year bond yield going up 75 basis points and, and it uh, being down 30 basis points from its high is the big story. Um, it, it, it's led to a lot of conversation, a lot of hand-wringing, a lot of back and forth on things it means, things that turned out not to have meant, whatever. But um, whether or not one is directly trying to invest in the fixed income space, and play bond yields, or just what it indicates about overall financial assets right now uh, and economic growth and so forth. The the ten year has been something to behold, primarily for how it is so uncooperatively moved relative to the narratives of the day. Uh, international market indices are all mostly higher. Um, it's actually Sweden's, by the way, in Europe that is the highest performer. Um, but the uh, developed EFI index is up at 11%, so it's up nicely, but just still pretty significant underperformance relative to U.S. market indices. And then the emerging markets is up 7% um, as a broad index. A lot of that has to do with weakness in some of the Chinese internet stocks that permeate that index. Um, so wh how do, what does this mean? When you talk about the S&P being up 15%, I think that ends up placing it at the 12th or 13th best um, first half of the year of all time. So that's something. But, you know, 13th best of all time is not, you know, that big of a deal. And and the fact that we've had 34 new closing highs this year, I think, is yet another mathematical reaffirmation of the silliness of looking at closing highs as some kind of a relevant data point. Um no matter what, how one's invested, whether they're more actively invested, whether they're more focused on value or quality or dividend growth, which are the kind of the things that matter to us, whether or not the sector allocations are more particular um, or they just simply mirror S&P um, sector weightings. The fact of the matter is that there's still a, a pretty fair question as to why market indices have done so well this year, after having done so well last year, and through the challenges of the moment. Uh, we are told that there's this possibility of big tax increases coming. We're told there's this uh, probability not only of inflation coming, but inflation already being here. Uh, we know markets have already had a big move up. So there's all these headwinds, and markets have kind of done what they've done. And of course, that could all just kind of be reversed. It could all move the other way. Um, but it does beg the question as to why markets have done what they've done. And here, here is the answer I will give you. I believe that there are three major issues that people have to understand. And, and just speaking to broad performance of risk assets in, in 2021 thus far. And number one, and, and these are in order, by the way, I think number two and number three are very significant. Number one and number two affect number three a lot. But I'm going to start with number one, which is the, the vaccine from start to finish. 
you first of all already last year had a better than worried market environment because COVID was not as fatal as people originally feared it would be. And because the most vulnerable part of the population proved to be far more identifiable than people initially feared. So you already had kind of a backdrop of the COVID scenario not being what had priced in as a left tail risk in the spring of 2020. Um, but nevertheless, you had a highly infectious disease that was less fatal than feared and more uh, identifiable in terms of vulnerabilities. But then there was the thought process that a vaccine would take X number of time and would have X number of challenges in getting it rolled out and distributed. And the fact of the matter is that the vaccine came far quicker and it wasn't a singular vaccine, it was plural. And it came with much better efficacy than had been expected. So you got it. You got it several times over with the Pfizer, Moderna, Johnson, Johnson, uh, et cetera. And you got a much higher efficacy of what we did get. Then you had what was on a relative basis, an outstanding rollout, but on an absolute basis, a pretty darn good rollout too. People could point to little pockets of challenges here and there. But more or less, we were able to get this by March and into April with a high degree of penetration of the vaccines out of the society. Uh, they also proved resilient against these different variants and other things that would pop up. So this is the number one story, okay? There was an economic reactivation that exceeded expectation. Markets do well when things exceed expectations to the upside. But then number two is this is happening with a backdrop of highly accommodated monetary policy. So you're not only getting all the re-accelerated re earnings and re-accelerated economic activity markets have to price in, you're getting it with something that is allowing a boost to the valuation of the very benign economic backdrop because of QE, quantitative easing, and because of ZERP, the zero interest rate policy. Those things put obviously highly um, uh, aggressive downward pressure on the risk-free rate, which push a lot of upward pressure on market multiples. So you get a higher valuation of a growing and, and positive economic circumstance. Then number three was profits. And corporate profits were aided by vaccine pushing reacceleration and by lower debt service costs because of a benign monetary policy environment. But be that as it may, whether it was from number one, number two, and just other circumstances, we started the year, I put a chart of this in Dividend Cafe, expecting 23% year-over-year profit growth, which would have been huge. We're now tracking that we're going to end up at 37% year-over-year profit growth. So obviously, profits had troughed to some degree out of the COVID moment, the lockdowns. We ex expected an awful lot of profit recovery. We're getting all of that and then some. So it's a major story for 2021 stock prices. It's also, in my opinion, a story for 2022 stock prices because we expected profit growth next year to be about 16%. Right now, it's going to end up being probably closer to 11 or 12%. All these things fluctuate as circumstances change. But why are profit growth expectations for next year come down? Because the profits that we experience next year will grow off of a higher number because of 2021's profit outperformance. So you, you get a kind of multiple effect in that into the future. I think that's important to understand. The, one of the things I want to kind of focus on is what this COVID recovery, because it is unique. It is very, uh, there's not a direct precedent to what this economic recovery looks like. You can compare it to financial crisis. You can compare it to the 82 recession. There's all kinds of things that have happened bad in markets over the years. You can compare it to dot-com. But you know, this was specific to a global health pandemic. And there, were, there was a lot of fiscal and monetary response, both domestically and globally. Um, but it's different than in a kind of organic or homegrown recession that we may have had with like a credit crisis or with an asset bubble bursting like dot-com. So you always have to look to these things where there are historical parallels with an understanding of where there are not historical parallels. But I think that we're now looking at a recovery before it kind of uh, consolidating and slowing down in the market, not the economy, the stock market, that has gone a little higher at this point in time and a little longer than some of the past recoveries. And I have a chart of these overlapping things that you can look at at dividendcafe.com.
So does that add to the kind of risk level? Does it um, reaffirm the idea that we could be due for a correction? My view on this is very simple. If you need that to anecdotally to reaffirm the fact that a correction could be coming, then by all means, you know, take note of it. It's just that you shouldn't need that to tell you because that reality is there no matter what. My view is that there are normal corrections that we ought to expect, and we haven't really even had one of those. Um, so to me, just simply being generically aware, generically defensive, uh, generically conscious of our own appetite for volatility is a wise thing for us to do now and at any other time. But I think that when you look at a couple of the themes that have been heavily discussed throughout 2021, the few I want to focus on are, first of all, this growth to value type story. And I do think, interestingly enough, that 2021 was a story of value over growth so far. Yet the second quarter, and especially June, was a story of growth over value. So that really just speaks to how much of a head start this calendar year value had over growth. But um, in reality, a lot of the growth stuff has hung in there just fine, or at least has rebounded quite nicely here in the last several weeks. Um, do I believe that there are excessive and frothy valuations in the NASDAQ and technology and big tech? I do. I just think it's a kind of unhelpful thing to say. I don't know when some of these things revert to the mean. I do know that generally speaking, they always do revert to the mean. It's a law of nature. Um, but along the way, a lot of things can happen and they can take longer than a lot of people expect. As a general secular theme, my expectation is for an extended period of value outperforming growth as far as those general styles and broad generic descriptions are concerned. And I would add to that, that um, the, the risk paradigm makes that even more true. In other words, regardless of what actually happens with performance, the skew of where that risk reward trade-off is heavily favors value over growth for all the valuation reasons and, and, and um, economic circumstances that we've described. The big major financial story that God knows I spoke about ad nauseum here at Dividend Cafe, and it was covered extensively throughout financial media and with a lot of market commentary, was about inflation. I want to point out back in late March when bond yields peaked on the year, when the inflation story was now really becoming the headline story du jour, that since then, utilities are flat. Consumer staples are basically flat. They're up like 2%. The growth has actually outperformed value since then. Bitcoin is down almost 50%. It's down over 40%. And, and they talk about Bitcoin, albeit, in my opinion, erroneously, as some sort of an inflation hedge instrument. So there is um, a lot of inconvenient actuality out there in the face of various narratives. The inflation story is very complicated for all the reasons we've talked about. We are living through a period of price levels, some of which are very high in their price movement, versus very low price levels of a year ago, this so-called base effect. And so that skews the conversation. It certainly complicates it. The supply disruptions, particularly in the semiconductor space, have had a profound impact on supply demand um, and ability to, to get product to different places, ergo pushing prices higher in a lot of cases. We know about the $5 trillion dollars of additional government spending that has uh, happened as a result of three COVID bills. And, and then, of course, the, the story of bond yields, uh, which is, to me, one of the great arguments um, of the inflation thesis being inaccurate, um, has been a, a really important story to watch, along with all the other dialogue that has taken place about the supply chain or about lumber prices or whatever the case may be. My own view is that you have an economy that people pretty much consensus view is going to grow somewhere between six and 8% real GDP. Our economic advisor here at the Bonds Group thinks it's going to be even higher than that. And you have a 10-year bond yield at 1.45%. Now, no one believes that six to 8% of economic growth is sustainable. It's all uh, recovery-driven growth. But my point is that you do not have a bond yield. 
indicating anything other than extremely low growth and low inflation in the economy. Something is wrong and something is right. And my view is that the bond market is right and the consensus view is wrong. But I do not believe that all arguments for inflation concerns are thoughtless. I think it is reasonably thoughtless, or at least not fully informed, to just simply point to lumber prices moving way higher or used car prices and saying, see, look, we told you inflation. However, I think a more thoughtful argument about inflation would be, okay, there's a lot of transitory effects. There's a lot of base effect. There's a lot of supply disruption, idiosyncratic circumstances, and that is probably distorting the present inflation picture. However, we think a lot of these things are going to end up getting anchored and being sticky, therefore proving inflation into the future. I don't agree with the view, but I consider it a very thoughtful and prima facie plausible perspective. But it still is rooted in an economic view that believes government debt is inherently inflationary when I not only do not believe government debt is inflationary, I believe it to be the opposite. I believe it to be disinflationary. And this is something I've talked about so much throughout the year. Um, the budget deficits we have right now being about 19% of GDP. Uh, you got to understand during World War II, it was 20% of GDP. So we're right at like World War II levels of deficit to GDP ratio, yet immediately after World War II, we got that number down to 7% and the next year down to 4%. The deficit to GDP collapsed post-war spending, and that's just not going to happen this time around. The deficit to GDP numbers are going to stay highly elevated. And in, it is my opinion, when you look back at the history of debt bubbles in our country, that it has created more disinflationary factors than anything else. And all of the things I've talked about throughout the year have led me to try to form a macro formulation to expect low growth, slow growth, and favor quality for that reason, believing that we have a problem of national savings in our country as a result of excessive government debt, that problem of national savings means there's less money for investment, and the less money for investment means you get less growth and productivity over time. This is not the stuff inflationary booms are made out of. Um, all that up against a time in which I think the Fed's monetary policy options are very asymmetrical. They can absolutely slow down the economy by tightening monetary policy, but they cannot prime the economy for at this point with more loose monetary policy. They've already gotten to the zero bound, so they've lost the weapon of offense, and then they still have the other side that's an asymmetrical monetary policy that I think uh, has to be understood. So I'll stay off the inflation deflation obsession beyond that, but it, it plays a lot into what has taken place this year, what a lot of people are, are talking about when they analyze the current market circumstances and gives you a reaffirmation of what our view going, going forward is. Um, what do I believe is going to be the theme for the second half of the year? I, I don't expect another 15% return in markets, but how can we get more positive returns and where will those positive returns come from? I think so much that will depend on the yield curve. This gets to be a little bit more complicated. The yield curve had widened out quite a bit. It was up around 160 basis points spread, 1.6% difference between a two-year and a 10-year. And that number right now is down about 125 or 130 basis points. And I think if the yield curve flattens further, that probably is negative for all risk assets. If it widens, then it is probably good for risk assets in general, but particularly good for value financials, maybe not as good for technology and high PE stocks. However, in the context of the yield curve moving, I would also add just overall credit circumstances that you're looking at extremely tight spreads with both investment grade corporate bonds and high yield corporate bonds. And that is not so much important for a lot of people's investments directly, unless they of course own those types of bonds. Um, it is important for our purposes or to what it indicates about risk level throughout the whole economy and risk level throughout financial markets. And when I'm looking at investment grade corporates at about 80 basis point spread 
very, very tight, almost as tight as we've ever seen. 300 basis points in high yield. That is not at all the tightest we've ever seen, but it's very small and it just indicates a lot of stretch for yield. People having to mush, push out the risk curve to reach for return that can go on for a long period of time, but it does generally not end well. And it generally creates an elevated level of risk in the financial markets and um, a, mal a kind of distortion of risk and reward trade-offs. So as far as the remainder of the year, I'm going to leave you with three concluding thoughts. There are pockets of excess and speculation that I don't happen to believe the Bonson Group's invested in, but I think that they are permeating across a lot of investment universe. Whether it's the crypto and the meme stocks and the really kind of speculative tech space, there is just simply different things right now that are very popular that I think speak to a greater silliness and euphoria than fundamentals and logic. I have no interest in saying that that's going to end in September or going to end by December. I, I have no call on that whatsoever. I just simply know that whether it was the Japan bubble in 89, the dot-com bubble that I lived through as a professional investor, the financial crisis that was a defining moment in my whole career, these are bubbles in history that I've studied extensively, that the bubbles had formed way before they ended up actually bursting. So the fact that a bubble can form and stay for a while is not new and is not in any way to be taken as a positive sign. It does, when you, a bubble sticks around a bit, it does not mean it isn't a bubble. I believe people are wise to peel back from some of those things that may be more driven by euphoria and popularity and the faddishness of the moment and less defensible from a mathematical, economic, logical, or reasonable, reasonable standpoint. Number two, I do believe the risk-reward skew favors value over growth. I think that what we saw in Q1 is more likely to be the theme later into the end part of the year, but I don't think it'll happen in the same way. You had deeply undervalued uh, uh, areas in energy and financials that were huge leaders in the early part of the year. And I think right now you're more likely to see value outperform, but with consumer staples. Perhaps utilities get back in the mix as well. But I think that the sector weightings, or excuse me, sector leadership will change relative to what it was earlier in the year, but that, that macro theme of value outperforming growth is very likely to continue. And then number three is I just think the political risk was so perversely misunderstood and overstated both going into the election and then throughout the all of Q1, Q2, all of the hand wringing, they're going to do this, they're going to do that. And I think markets uh, just continue to shrug it off, even as the media and a lot of investors and a lot of advisor community continue to believe, oh my gosh, they're, they're tripling our capital gain taxes tomorrow. What do we do? Well, I think all of that was tremendously overstated. And now I believe it has the possibility of becoming understated as we get more clarity as to where these things are going. And I don't mean what President Biden says or what NBC says or what Fox says. I mean, what can get done legislatively that, absolutely, that can actually become law that then we will have a chance for markets to be able to fully price those realities in. And my belief, as I've said countless times, was that the worst case scenarios and all of those things were highly unlikely to happen. But the best case scenarios are probably not going to happen either. Markets have probably priced in something a little bit worse than best case scenario. So on the margin, political things by the end of the year will become more pertinent than they are right now. Uh, in our chart of the week, by the way, at Dividend Cafe, I go quite extensively into housing prices. I put a chart about this just hockey stick leg up in the percentage of growth in housing prices, why I see it as mostly a negative thing, um, but having sprinkles of positive in it. The uh, fact that 87% of homeowners right now have 80% or less loan to value, meaning 20% or more equity is one of the great blessings of our time as it pertains to housing prices relative to the last time we saw this kind of euphoric move higher. Equity is the great protector here. It was 26% of homeowners in 2009 
that had a over 100% loan to value, meaning negative equity. So that becomes the point at which all hell breaks loose. I don't think we can go back there because we simply have greater protective equity and we have better underwriting into the loan profile of America's debt on its housing supply. But we are underbuilt in housing, largely as a hangover from how overbuilt we were pre-crisis. Uh, we had a long period of time where there was inadequate household formation. Now, demographically, we've shifted to where there's more household formation. We have an inadequate supply. You then combine the octane of very low interest rates on this, and you're just getting stupid prices in housing again. Does that lead to systemic risk? I don't think so. However, it does if and when the speculators come back in in droves, and they haven't yet. I think that they will, but they haven't yet. So supply needs to come up. Demand is going to continue to be quite high, I believe, for some time. And then the interest rate level is really needing to normalize in order to create a, a bubble-like condition that draws in speculators and then gives us a negative feedback loop none of us want to think about. So I've covered a lot of ground there, but I hope, I hope you've gotten a kind of picture of what's taken place so far this year, good, bad, and ugly, where some of the narratives have been off or where we offer a kind of contrarian view on some of those narratives and what my perspective is going in the second half of the year. I do feel awareness about elevated price levels, about some euphoria. I'm continually focused on avoiding those pockets that I consider to be rank excesses in financial markets. And we're ready to face the second half of the year with the principles that we bring to every year at the Bonson Group, which I think you know very well if you're a longtime listener and reader of the Dividend Cafe. I'm going to bid you adieu now and wish you a very happy Independence Day. Enjoy your 4th of July weekend. Please celebrate, as me and my family will, the birth of this great nation, the birth of the American experiment, and everything it represents as you pursue life, liberty, and your pursuit of happiness. Thanks for listening to and watching the Dividend Cafe. 